Todd Hughes and David Ebersol are with us. Before we start, I just want to do a quick shout out to Gina Shop. Um, it's a great drummer, Go Go's are a great band. Um, I'm from Baltimore, Gina's from Baltimore. Uh, I'm from the suburbs, which is why I talk the way I do, which is not like Gina talks. But the way Gina talks, that's how people from Baltimore talk. It's not, not like Dominic West doesn't fucking talk. <laughs> <laughs> that's how people from Baltimore talk. And, and what was her first name? Oh, God, I should know this. This is EMA. That's right, that's right. Uh, John Mark. <laughs> that's got to be like, I got nowhere. I'm like, yeah, I've, I've heard of your mom. I'm so old. Um, one thing I want to ask you about is this, the second episode of this movie, or this time, is, you know, obviously, do these movies with the second do several interviews. At the end, what you learn these interviews are almost what they're nervous. But the interview where Patty, the one where Patty talks about her descent, basically, just her whole her whole narrative of going from getting kicked out of the van kind of to becoming kind of a crack whore on the street was pretty much from that one interview. Did it take a long time for her to work up to be able to tell that story and sort of get it out in, in one go? Um. The interesting thing about Patty was is that even as we started our very first interview and I would say, okay, this is going to be an easy one and I'm just going to ask you about the early days. And she would immediately begin connections between what went on for her there um, and then how that sort of led to, you know, to path addiction or whatever it might have been. Uh, and so that particular interview, which is what we call the green interview, because she's sort of more green, um, she, uh, we told her, like, this is, good. this is gonna be the big one. We're gonna ask you all the really hard questions. And she is such a great raconteur, and so she started telling all of those stories with all this incredible sense of humor. And as we started putting the movie together, we were like, God, she never really tells you one of those stories about these harrowing things that happened to her as though it was awful. It's always with all of this kind of, like, almost, um, uh, creating a funny story out of the fact that she was a on the street. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so I actually, from that interview, learned a lot about Patty, which is that I learned that I think that that's part of what helped her to be a survivor, is that she didn't ever let herself get to that place where that stuff got so dark for her. I mean, obviously awful and terrible, but when she finally sort of came out of it, that she could look back with all that humor was, uh, was kind of amazing to me. Thanks for questions. Like Oprah. <laughs> Hi, um, I just wanted to say congratulations on the film, thank you. I've just worked it out and I think I've been a massive whole fan for like 16 years and there's loads of stuff in there that I didn't know and was really interesting and nice to see. Oh. And um, my question was, um, I first heard about the film on Kickstarter and I kind of backed it and was obsessed with seeing it so it's really nice thank to you. see it today. <laughs> um, but my question was, would you consider using Kickstarter again as a film funding avenue and how did you find the experience? Does it, did it work out well? Uh, it, it was great for a lot of reasons and uh, the sort of hilarious thing about, we're on a panel uh, tomorrow talking about crowdfunding too, but the hilarious thing for us about it was that we were totally against it, Todd and I, and we just thought like it's embarrassing and you're going out and you're asking you know, people for money and, and you know, we're at a certain level in our careers, we shouldn't be asking people for money. And then Alice and Anders did it. And we were like, well, God, if Alice can do it, I guess it's like, you know, it's not such an embarrassing thing to go out and ask, and ask people. And Christina, our other producer, was the one who was really behind doing it. And it was great for our movie for a lot of reasons. Just like that, it was the first time people had heard of it. And it started word of mouth. And we started having, you know, uh, you know friends on Facebook. and. So people started knowing about the movie, where I don't think they did before. Also, Linda Perry came along, um, and you know Linda Perry, she's a producer, and a uh, great producer, and she came along at the end when she saw that we were close after the second day on Facebook, and she put us over the top so that we would definitely be funded, and it made news. So it was suddenly like we were a movie that people had heard of, and people were talking about Linda Perry supports, you know, Patty Schemmel's survival story, and it made sort of, you know, rock and roll news. Um, so it helped us in a, in a lot of different ways that we weren't expecting, and it started to get the kind of, you know, fan swell behind the movie and have people go, oh, there's going to be this movie about Patty, and, then, and we got all sorts of support. And a lot of the support that we got also were in people offering cool things for Kickstarter, so that there were things for people to want to, to come on and get. Gina Shock of the Go-Go's gave us t-shirts, um, you know, so it was, a, so it kind of grew from 
Kickstarter. I would definitely do it again. I do think there's only a certain amount of times that you can go to the well, and I think that, uh, that this particular instance, Patty has fans, so it wasn't about us, it was a lot about her, and that tends to be sort of the, the ongoing idea about what this movie is, is that you know, whenever we sort of get accolades or something, we say, well, you know, that's great, but it actually really is about Patty, uh, which I think is true and, and ongoing. So I think I, that happened from well, Kickstarter. Couldn't have finished that without you, so. Yeah. 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 Heather Bendler, who's one of our associate producers on the movie, she bought a, a you know a five thousand dollar Kickstarter. She's out of what, Ohio, uh, I can't remember Chicago. Chicago, and she just said, I want to support something interesting and I want to do something good for the world, and I'm giving you guys five thousand dollars. And then Kickstarter paid for a post film. Yeah. After we'd gotten into this festival, and we were like, oh no, we actually have to show the movie. Yeah. So we were desperate, and that was the perfect time. And we raised just over $20,000, which was our bill. So. Yeah. There's a lot of that. I've seen a lot of campaigns. And we pay attention, obviously, to the music downloads, where we are at the site. And a lot of them, because so many of these films are like this, Labor's love and passion projects that you shoot for three, four, five years um, with, with people you care about, artists you care about, and then you get to the end, it's like rights clearance, <laughs> you know, you know, and all these things. So a lot of the campaigns now are, 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 are not so much about shooting or getting it off the ground, but they're about help us finish the movie and get it out. Yeah. Do we have anything else? Any questions over here? Yeah. Um, and then so we'll move it back. What was Courtney's? take on the movie and, and, and with, were there issues with clearing music? Um, we got a lot of support, but again, again, when you call people up and say, hi, we're the dudes who are making the movie about Patty Schemmel, uh, who is now in recovery and trying to get her life together and she wants to you know, have a movie made about her, a lot of doors open and people were very generous. So Courtney and Eric gifted all of the uh, publishing rights to the movie, otherwise it really, literally couldn't exist. They had a lot of guilt to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> they also, um, they made sure that the record companies knew that, and so we got a very, very, very favorable, favorable deal for the couple of times that we used what's called master use. So publishing is, is writing, and so anytime they're playing live, we don't have to do anything but get rights from the writers of the songs, which is almost always Courtney and Eric. Um, uh, at least they own the publishing on all of it. And then uh, if you actually play the recorded music from the record or from the music videos, which you do, we do a couple of times in the movie, that's when you have to go to the record company and normally they just say, sorry, this is our price tag, we can't do it. They gave us the lowest possible price that they could give it, they step deal it out for as we go forward so that if we you know, uh, sell a million dollars of, you know, of receipts, then we pay this much if we pay, you know, et cetera, as it went on. So uh, because of Patty and the band support, everyone was really generous about it. Uh, Billy Corgan, also who has writing credit on Celebrity Skin, gifted Celebrity Skin and the title of the movie, It's So Hard, the movie, the song's not in the movie, but it's a, it's a whole song from Celebrity Skin, and we had to get clearance on being able to use the title. Uh, Courtney saw it for the first time, she never asked to see it. She signed off in it 100%, signed off on Kurt's image, signed off on all the private footage of her, Kurt, uh, and the baby, uh, without ever seeing the movie, all in support of Patty. Again, that's what I keep saying. Is that it's like, you know, it's not for us. It's for Patty. Um, and uh, she um, saw it for the first time at the Museum of Modern Art in a packed auditorium of 400 people, and we were sitting behind her, watching her as it was going on. And at one point, she got up, went to the went to the restroom. Our publicist was out in the restroom, and he offered her, "Do you need something? Do you need something?" She was like, "No, no, I gotta get back and see the movie." She just had to pee. And she ran back inside, and then she opened up her phone and texted him. We're like, she's texting her lawyer, saying, shut this movie down. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but no, so uh, she hugged me. Uh, you know, Courtney and I don't really know each other. We've done an interview. We've been in a couple of rooms together. Um, but she hugged me when the movie was over on stage in front of everyone, said, Francis Bean really needs to see the movie. She, Francis signed off. She's 18. Uh, she signed off saying uh, that she never wants to see it. <laughs> but she was, you know, she was willing to, to you know, give Patty the rights so that, she, so that her image could be used inside of the movie. Um, and actually there's, there's a funny clause that's about um, where you, you are indemnified as the filmmakers for anything that somebody says inside of the making of your movie. And that's the one thing that she wanted crossed out, her lawyers wanted crossed out, and we're like, she's a baby. <laughs> 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 She says, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did, um, 
Did Courtney also share her snacks with you? Uh, her what? Her snacks? Her snacks! <laughs> uh, okay, no! <laughs> she said she was going to, so she said, send up an extra large plate to the guests. Never offered his one. That, that's like the most casual interview I think I've ever seen. Usually well, the first question is, what was Courtney eating? Short break <laughs> Actually, we saw the HBO movie of Great Gardens about the Maisley brothers making Great Gardens, and the only way they got those women to be so intimate was by being two people. And we had been doing shoots with Patty with like a crew of five to ten people. And you know, I think by the time she really started to open up, we pared it down to three people. But with Courtney, Eric, and Melissa, it was just David and I. And they really forgot they were on camera, I think, sometimes. Especially Courtney really opened up and we could just put out her interview as a movie. The two hours we spent with her. Credits on the meeting, credits on the Yeah. We had a question uh, way in the back there, I think. No, I saw that. Okay. Anybody? Yeah. Hi, I'm Jeff. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, from a narrative perspective, the several threads that you have running in the first half of your film, sort of whole story and the story of female drummers and Kurt and Courtney's story um, sort of um, differ greatly from Patty's later recovery and marriage and that kind of thing. And I was wondering to what extent you thought that they were part of her story and to what extent they're separate from it. Um, we were, it's a funny thing actually making, making a movie where somebody has shot most of the footage themselves because if you think about it, that means she's not on camera very much. So we were, so a lot of times even the split screen came out of the idea that we had to figure out how to get Patty inserted into the movie. And on that idea, we also felt like it, there was only so much that you could stray from Patty's story before the audience would get restless and say, why are we over here in, you know, in Kurt and Courtney land uh, and the baby when really what we should be is you know, over there learning about more about Patty. And yet, um, the path that Patty took in life had a lot to do with her relationship with Kurt, had a lot to do with how she got there, um, her, her intimate relationship with them, where she's there, you know, around when they are just hanging out with their baby, is part of the reason that she was so on an inner circle with people who were, as Melissa says, playing with death. And so we also felt like, and, and Patty would say it, that, uh, you know, Kurt's death, and Kristen's death were two of the most, uh, you know, remarkable things that happened in her life at that time, and really scared her and changed her path in other ways. And so uh, she, Courtney is a bit of an exaggeratrix, and I don't think that it's true that Patty was, you know, uh, Kurt's only confidant or one of two, you know, or something like that. Uh, I think that he liked Patty, I think he loved her, I think he, that, they were, that they were very close friends, but she would say, no, you know, that's a little bit of an exaggeration that, that, is, that it is that deep between me and Kurt. But, uh, but in terms of the, the structure of the movie and the idea of how she got affected, we really felt like you wanted to get that amazing footage in, but you needed it to relate back to her story in some way, somehow. Uh, it's, we have a little trick in the movie, which is that right before we go into the Thinking of You sequence, Patty is talking about songwriting, and so then you're sort of like, see, here's an example of songwriting. Now we can show you the whole, you know, the song that is this amazing thing that, that is on tape that no one has ever gotten to see before. So, and the reason we have it on tape is that it's part of Patty's collection of archival material. So it was a, it was a back and forth in terms of what's interesting to the audience about the whole world and what's specifically interesting about Patty's life, her struggle, and what she went through. And so it's even why we did what we call kind of a, uh, a, um, a cherry-picking kind of structure, that we didn't stay with, and then she was young, and then this happened, and then it, you know, then it went to that, which is that, we, you know, uh, we actually call it kind of like wild strawberries, which, you know, when, when you pick a strawberry and it gives you a thought, then you, then you go into the next thing, and so if somebody says something and it leads us to the next thought, and we moved on to that as our sort of structure of how to tell Patty's part of the story. Um, but it, every time we left her for too long, the movie fell apart. <laughs> and now people sometimes sort of say, like, I want more Patty. Well, well you do, but you also want to, <laughs> you want to see the other stuff that she, that she got access to. And then her legacy and the history of female drummers 
was such an interesting aspect because she has this pantheon that very few women get to as musicians. And also, we, you know, we're a little older. So we're into the Go-Go's and the Bangles. And it was really fun to like meet those people and Fanny. And we actually had Sheila E on the line for an interview. And um, you know, most of that stuff is on the cutting room floor because it was not relevant to the story. So we hoped we could get enough of those people because they're so interesting and have lived a similar lifestyle and career path. But um, it was sort of a guilty pleasure for us. You could, uh, maybe with the footage you have, but you or someone could make a film about certainly female musicians, but just female drummers, because it's, you know, you're right, that's even rarer than, you know, the cliche is the female bass player, and every band's a female bass player, I mean, the female drummers are so few and far between. And the story of where sexism still creeps in genderism still creeps in to, to, to rock and roll and it's still this boys game is hardest to you know it, hit, it does hit hardest where, where the drummer is because that's not supposed to be where the girls are. they can sing they can play bass one of the most shocking uh, things that got said in the whole movie to me is when eric says and he couldn't play with anybody else, any girls in the room so i had to teach him all the parts by myself with no women in the room in a female driven rock band we were like this shocking <laughs> I noticed there was um, none of the band members together at any stage you never interviewed Eric according to you or did you think that was a bit of a cheap trick or were they just weren't available at the same time or were they hate each other now or, or, <laughs> well, well first of all they don't live in the same place so that was so that was part of it which is that they really don't live in the same place um, and then also uh, the first time that those four people who were really you know what most people sort of consider the core whole uh, were ever in a room together for 13 years was when we premiered at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and so uh, they all had you know some communication and all had issues and in fact Courtney and Eric were not talking at all by the time we made the movie because of the issues over the new role um, and so uh, and Patty and Eric did not talk for years and Melissa and Patty had gotten together for a lunch to talk about whether or not she would participate in the movie. Uh, and so everyone had their kind of 10-year-old grudges still sort of hanging on. And it was all a little reluctant to get to talking about it again and all incredibly generous once we were there. So uh, what would happen is that Patty would make a first inter introduction by email or to assistants and then uh, we would follow up and sort of try to book a date and get a date. Our interview with Courtney was supposed to happen in Los Angeles, and we were first booked to go to her house, and then she moved out of her house and moved into the Chateau Marmont. And then when she was in the Chateau Marmont, we got uh, a text from her assistant saying, Court, it looks like Courtney's moving to New York tomorrow. Uh, she's probably going to get on a midnight flight, which is very hard to get on to a plane, so we'll let you know in the morning. <laughs> And then at 8 a.m. they were like, Courtney's gone. So we were supposed to interview her that next day. So then we had to figure out how to get an interview with her in New York a year later. So, so and getting them together while they were talking about all of this difficult stuff, I think just would not have been the way that we would have gotten any of them to talk about it. We did have Metallica fantasies of getting them all in the same room to talk about this stuff, but it was hard enough to get each of them individually. They really were not a close knit band. And when they saw each other, it was great. They actually came out with us afterwards. And everyone's like, Are you going to reunite? Are you going to reunite? And I think they all were like, Maybe. And then when they actually hung out together, they were like, No. <laughs> <laughs> I now have a new favorite line about difficult rock stars. She's very, she's hard to get on the plane. <laughs> we have time for one more question. When did you actually start the interviews with um, the other members of the band? I mean, obviously, Class 8 went from about, um, I'm guessing, mid 2000 era. And um, when did you actually start the interviews with the other members of the band? And how long did like, the process take? So, Patty brought us all the archival footage in 2007. Oh. And that's when, we, that's when we did our first interview with her. That's what we call the blue interview, when she's on the blue couch and the blue t shirt. Right. Um, and then the first person who agreed to be interviewed after that was Melissa. And that was summer of 2008. 
summer of 2008, and we went and we spent two days at her house and hung out with her and went to dinners and we talked about things off camera and then come back together to talk to her again on camera. And uh, we were getting introduced to the story at that point, so I look back and I think, how did I even know what questions to ask? And she was telling me the story, and then I was re-watching things later and going, oh, that's what happened when they just left me skin, and I would go back and try to figure it out. Um, Courtney, we finally got uh, in September of 2009, um, and then Eric, the, the, truth, them, Eric said, okay. the truth is, is that Eric was the most private. Um, he was the most reluctant to sign off. He never, he didn't want to sign a piece of paper saying that we could that we could use things. So we only got him to say it on camera. And then I think finally in the end, when you asked, he's the only person who asked to see a movie, and he saw it in the end and was happy with it and had actually a couple of really great comments about accuracy and made some things better. Uh, and um, he and Patty were the ones that back in the day were the least of friends and today are best of friends. Yeah. Through the, a lot through the interview. Yeah. She had no idea what he felt and what he thought until she saw like, you know, what, what he talks about. Or Melissa, or she's been closer to Courtney over the years because she did do um, America's Sweetheart. Yeah, yeah. So they stayed yeah, I do remember like some footage from like sort of um, studio recordings when I saw them together and I always thought, you know, like when um, I first heard the movie I was so excited because I thought, you know, well, I always did wonder, you know, what happened to Patty and, you know, like, thank you guys so, so much for doing this because, you know, like whole fans, you know, you really do think you were missing like a massive chunk and, you know, I think being sort of in our mid-twenties now, you sort of just off the cusp of, you know, really living it at the time, so this has just been an amazing evening, thank you so, so much. Thank you. So,